On the morning of the 6th of June 1944, British, Canadian and American troops landed on the beaches of Normandy. Soon they would expand their beachhead, causing all available German units to flood to northern France. The Normandy landing saw the Western Allies finally open up a second front. Germany would now have to further split its forces, fighting in France, Italy and in the east. The Red Army seized this long-awaited moment, the Soviet summer offensive would begin exactly three years after the start of Operation Barbarossa, on the 22nd of June 1944. The Fall of the Third Reich, the Eastern Front Part 4 After the liberation of Ukraine, an enormous bulge had been created in Balu Russia, occupied by German Army Group Center. Many of the German troops stationed there were veterans of Barbarossa, who had been hardened in the past three years of war. As Army Group South had been mauled during the fighting in Ukraine, the German High Command was convinced the Soviets would press their advantage in the South. This false belief was aided by Soviet deception, known as Maskirovka. Troops were moved south during the day, before being secretly moved back by night. Reinforcements were hidden behind the lines as to not arouse suspicion. The Red Army even attacked into Romania, further drawing German reserves south. Army Group Center was stripped of many divisions, leaving just 34 divisions along the entire Belarusian front. The Soviet plan was to find weak points along the front and exploit them. They would flood the breakthroughs with mobile reinforcements, causing chaos behind the German lines and allowing them to perform massive encirclements. This became known as deep battle tactics. The operation, named Bagration, after the Napoleonic general, was one of the most ambitious offensives of the war. Its aim was to destroy Army Group Center and totally liberate Balu Russia, all in a mere two weeks. Between the 19th and the 20th of June, Soviet partisans began causing organized havoc behind the German lines, destroying railways, infrastructure and assaulting some German positions. The morning of June 22nd began with a relentless artillery barrage. Soviet shock troops stormed the front lines, riding the tanks and disembarking to destroy the frontline positions. Where the German defenses were breached, they flooded in reinforcements, forcing the Germans to withdraw to avoid being surrounded. Soon, the entire German front was broken. Within two days, the Soviets had achieved their first encirclement at Vitebsk, trapping the German L Third Corps in the city. Whilst a breakout was attempted, almost all 28,000 men were captured or killed by the 29th when Vitebsk was retaken. Once the breakthrough in the north was achieved, Soviet reinforcements flooded into advance along the Moscow, Minsk Highway and Seize Orsha. In the south, Mogilev was surrounded and taken, and the Soviets began advancing towards Bobrovsk. Heavier fighting occurred at Bobrovsk, where the Soviet 65th Army stormed the fortress city and managed to outflank and surround the majority of the German 9th Army. After days of vicious urban warfare, the German 9th Army was mostly annihilated, and the strategically important city was taken. After a highly successful first week, the operation entered its second phase. The fighting was now centered on Minsk, and the encirclement of the German 4th Army. The southern pincer began to advance on the capital, reaching Minsk on July 3. After a night of street-to-street -street fighting, the Belarusian capital was finally retaken by the Soviet Union. Soon after, they met up with units from the north, the Soviets had successfully surrounded the German 4th Army, along with the remnants of the 9th, all in all about 100,000 men. Soviet forces pursued the fleeing Germans north, securing the northern flank of the pocket. By mid-July, most of Balu Russia had been liberated, and the Red Army began to advance on the Baltic states. Within a few days the pocket at Minsk had been split in half. The Germans had lost most of their heavy equipment and tanks, and so when Soviet armor began penetrating their front lines they were left defenseless and were forced to surrender. By the 4th of July, Army Group Center had lost 25 of its 34 divisions, close to 300,000 men. Once again exploiting the breakthrough, Soviet forces raced on to encircle the Polish city of Vilnius, seizing it on the 13th of July. Further attacks were made towards Bialystok, Kaunas, and Riga, with the Soviets entering eastern Poland almost unopposed. By the 2nd of August they had reached the Vistula and had taken a few bridgeheads, 
though this was the breaking point of Soviet logistics, and the attack was halted. Just as Vilnius was seized in the far north, a new offensive began in the south. German Army Group South met a similar fate to Army Group North, in the first few days, Soviet forces broke through their defences and forced them to withdraw piecemeal, leading to the capture of Lvov on July 27. The first Ukrainian front encircled 45,000 German soldiers at Brody, and whilst a large number were able to escape the X-3 Army Corps was effectively destroyed. Exploiting gaps created in the front, the Soviet spearheads pushed on through to the Vistula River, causing chaos and heavy casualties for the German defenders. Once again finding themselves overextended, the Soviet pincers were forced to dig in around Sandomir's on the far bank of the Vistula. German counterattacks were heavy and determined, Soviet troops were outnumbered and outgunned by superior German heavy tanks, including Tiger IIs. Despite this, the bridgehead was held, and the Soviets were able to expand towards Sandomir's itself. Operation Bagration was the biggest German defeat of the war. Army Group Center and Army Group South were in tatters the Germans had lost half a million men and had mostly fallen back to pre-war borders. Belarusia had been totally liberated in a period of barely two months. Whilst the Soviets too lost a large number of men, by 1944 their losses were easily replaced, the Third Reich had literally run out of men to conscript. However, as Bagration came to an end, another battle started. In August 1944, a wave of uprisings swept across Nazi-occupied Poland. The Polish resistance, known as Armia Krajowa, was almost 400,000 people strong, a true testament to the Polish spirit of freedom. The Poles, who hated the Soviets almost as much as they hated the Germans, realized the only chance for escaping Soviet rule was by liberating themselves. On August 1, an uprising broke out in Warsaw. Despite achieving early success, Nazi General Heinrich Himmler sent in the SS to brutally suppress the resistance. Warsaw 1944 saw some of the worst atrocities of the war committed. By the end of the 63-day uprising, almost 80% of the city lay in complete ruin. 200,000 Polish citizens would be systematically slaughtered, the remaining 500,000 were expelled from the capital. Meanwhile, Soviet forces simply stood by and watched. Some would argue this was because of overextended supply lines, others argue Stalin did not intervene for political reasons, as by allowing the revolutionaries to die there would be none who could oppose post-war Soviet rule. The major offensive of August began on the 20th, when the Red Army began attacking into Romania. At this point in the war, the Romanian army was making up a significant portion of the Axis armies in the east and a Soviet attack earlier in the year had failed to break through into Romania. Whilst the offensive earlier in the year had failed, the August offensive was able to break through joint Romanian-German defences and Soviet assault troops began sweeping into Romania proper. Three days later, Romanian King Michael met with the President Antonescu and demanded he withdraw Romania from the war. After the Prime Minister refused, the King started a coup by ordering soldiers into the room to arrest him. Taking control of the country, King Michael withdrew from the Axis and ordered Romanian soldiers to turn against the Wehrmacht, before offering an armistice to the Allies. The Soviets, however, neglected to side with the Romanians for another month, taking the opportunity to pour more troops into the country and take 150,000 Romanian soldiers prisoner, in yet another move to ensure Soviet post-war dominance. The German units left in Romania were cut off and massively outnumbered. Ironically, the 6th Army, rebuilt after being annihilated at Stalingrad, was encircled for a second time. Additionally, Romania's cessation from the Axis left the Third Reich without any major source of oil. A large German garrison was sent to defend the vital oil field at Ploiesti, but it was soon surrounded and destroyed, further worsening the Axis oil crisis. By September 24, most of Romania was under Soviet occupation. The 500,000 men left in the Romanian army joined the Red Army, and would aid the Soviets in their conquest of Hungary and Czechoslovakia. On September 8, the Soviet Union declared war on Bulgaria. Despite being part of the Axis, Bulgaria had never declared war on the USSR and thus joined Romania in offering to join the Allies and declaring war on Germany. Bulgarian troops simply lined the roads as the Soviet invaders entered, and soon were actively fighting against the Germans. 
Following the occupation of Bulgaria, the Soviets began attacks into Yugoslavia. Jointly with the famous Yugoslav partisans, who had been successfully fighting a war against the German occupiers for three years, they took Belgrade on October 20. The Baltic Front had remained in a stalemate since the liberation of Leningrad, with the Battle of Narva having grinded on for six months. Narva, situated at the top of Lake Pepus, was of extreme strategic importance, as it was the only gateway into Estonia. After renewed attacks Narva was seized on July 26, allowing the Soviets to break through into the rest of Estonia. In the south, Soviet forces broke through the German defences and pushed on to Riga. With the front lines collapsing, German and Estonian units withdrew towards the south, where they were forced towards the coast and into the Latvian peninsula of Courland. Some German units were able to withdraw towards Memel, where they were besieged and forced to slowly evacuate by sea. The 200,000 men trapped in Courland were encircled, and would too be slowly evacuated over the next few months. This would come to be known as the Courland Pocket, and it would last right up until the end of the war in May 1945. It was also at this time that Finland finally surrendered, exiling the German units inside from their country. One by one, Nazi Germany was being abandoned by its allies, with only Hungary remaining by its side. Talking of Hungary, soon it too was in the Soviet crosshairs. After Romania declared war on Germany, much of Army Group South was forced to retreat disastrously through the Carpathian Mountains back into Hungary, a perilous march that led to the deaths of many soldiers. Hungary had been occupied earlier in the year, and despite signing an armistice on October 15, a pro-Nazi party was immediately ushered into power ensuring the Hungarians would fight until the end. Starting in October, the Red Army began attacking into Hungary. Despite some early failures at the Battle of Debrecen, Budapest was encircled on December 26, 1944, and put to siege. Nearly 70,000 German and Hungarian troops were trapped inside the city, which held out until February 1945. And so came the fourth and final winter of the Eastern Front. Within the space of six months, the Soviets had destroyed the majority of German divisions in the east, retaken all of Belarus and the Baltic states and broken up the Axis powers. Romania was now fighting against the Nazis, as was Bulgaria and Finland. The Western Allies had defeated the German counteroffensive in Belgium and were poised to strike at the Reich itself. However, as the Soviet troops began entering enemy territory, their desire for liberation became a desire for vengeance. After years of war fighting on their own territory, and after witnessing the German atrocities, the Soviet soldiers sought to extract revenge on the citizens of the Axis countries. Whilst Red Army commanders prevented any major massacres, they had no qualms about letting mass rapes, looting and murders be carried out on the people of Romania, Hungary, Poland and eventually Germany. This is to say that despite the heroic actions of the Soviet soldiery in World War II, they had the ability to commit war crimes just as depraved as their German counterparts. Things were unraveling quickly for Hitler's thousand-year Reich, and he would receive no respite in the winter months. Starting on January 12 the Soviets unleashed attacks all along the Vistula River, in what became known as the Vistula Oder Offensive. Expanding out of their bridgeheads, the Soviets streamed into western Poland. On January 17 Warsaw, or what was left of it, was taken. Two days later Kraków was encircled and occupied, and by February all of pre-war Poland had been captured by the USSR. In the north, the Soviets launched an offensive into German East Prussia, the first German territory to be invaded by the Soviets. A large number of divisions were cut off and encircled around Danzig, with the major city of Königsberg being besieged in late January. Then, on January 27, the Red Army stumbled upon something that even the past three years of war couldn't have prepared them for. Soldiers fighting in southern Poland noticed a horrific smell in the area, and followed the scent to its source. At 3 p.m. on the same day, a group of Soviet soldiers discovered the Auschwitz concentration camp. Auschwitz was not the first camp to be liberated, but it was by far the largest. Whilst the SS had evacuated the camp, they had left behind 7,000 inmates too ill to join the death march, many of whom died shortly after the Soviet arrival. The inmates would receive medical treatment from both the Polish Red Cross and Red Army hospitals, and a large number would survive, 
more camps would soon be uncovered, further fueling the Soviet desire for revenge. Whilst the USSR was certainly anti-Semitic, even the most hateful people in the Red Army were horrified by what was uncovered. With most of its armies destroyed, the Germans resorted to conscripting more and more civilians into the Wehrmacht. Volkssturm, People's Storm, units began appearing in the lines, consisting of those previously thought unfit for the military. As the Soviets drew closer and closer to Berlin, the Volkssturm would expand further, soon incorporating anybody from teenagers to pensioners in their ranks. However, the German High Command was able to scrape together a few of its remaining panzer divisions and sent them south for one last offensive. The objective was to secure Lake Balaton and the surrounding oil fields in Hungary, and to stall the coming Soviet offensive in Austria. Whilst the panzer divisions were largely made up of the famous German heavy tanks, they were all extremely understrength and many were bogged down in the muddy quagmire surrounding Balaton. The German units still made progress, but by March 15 the Soviet defenses had hardened and the panzers were repelled with heavy losses. The final German offensive of World War II had ended in failure, and ironically would lead to an even greater defeat. Exploiting their victory, the Soviets counterattacked and pushed hard into Austria and besieged Vienna. The Austrian capital was seized on April 10, followed by mass rapes and lootings in the ancient city. By April the front had stabilized and the Soviets were poised to make one last killing blow to the Third Reich. The German army lay in tatters, both in the east and west, and, at least in the west, Wehrmacht soldiers were surrendering in ever-increasing numbers. As the Western Allies broke into Germany, Stalin knew time was running out to secure the best post-war outcome. He immediately ordered Berlin to be taken as quickly as possible, no matter the casualties suffered. And so an offensive was quickly scrapped together to break through the heavily defended positions around the Silo Heights. Soviet soldiers would be forced to attack through the swamps and uphill to seize strong German defenses in the gateway to Berlin. To ensure victory, over a million troops were massed, compared to just 100,000 German. Despite extremely heavy casualties, the Soviet soldiers, many of whom knew the end of the war was mere weeks away, fought with a ferocity that shocked even their own commanders. By April 19, a mere three days after the start of the battle, all German defenses were broken. Hitler ordered Generals Steiner and Busser to counterattack, but both men made clear that they would waste no more lives. Instead, the 9th Army pulled back and began evacuating German civilians westward, leaving Berlin to its fate. With no one left between the Soviets and the city, by April 23 Berlin had been totally surrounded. War correspondent Vasily Grossman summed up the mood of the Soviet soldiers perfectly. Standing on the banks of the Oder, he wrote. I wanted to shout out, to call to all our brothers, our soldiers, who are lying in the Russian, Ukrainian, Belarusian and Polish S, who sleep forever on the fields of our battles. Comrades, can you hear us? We've done it. Fighting inside Berlin started on the same day, as Soviet armor pierced the outer suburbs. The city was mostly defended by Volkssturm militias, as well as members of the Hitler Youth and a few remnants of SS divisions. Both sides had learned a lot about urban warfare during the war and thus many new tactics were used. The Germans, copying Soviet tactics at Stalingrad, placed snipers on rooftops and knew that the cover of buildings was far more useful than the protection of a trench. Likewise, the Soviets had mastered use of artillery and tank tactics. These would prove very useful, as the Soviets were determined to make the battle as short as possible. Spurred on by Stalin, Generals Zhukov, Konev and Choykov competed for the most glory, often disturbingly risking the lives of their troops to ensure they would be able to take significant objectives. Soviet units stormed through the outer suburbs, encountering limited resistance from the city's defenders. Defense was stiffer at the Tempelhof airport, but this strong point too fell to the unstoppable Soviet hordes. It was only at this point that Hitler, who had remained inside the city, admitted all hope was lost. Fighting continued over the next week, as the Soviets tightened the noose around central Berlin. On April 30, Soviet units began storming across the Königsplatz towards the Reichstag, the German parliamentary building. To the Soviets it was the very symbol of Nazism, and thus massive importance was placed upon taking it. 
the building was heavily defended by French and Nordic SS troops, who had volunteered to join the SS and had thus given up all hope of returning home after the war. These men, who had nothing left to lose, fought tooth and nail for the building and the surrounding area. Despite determined resistance, the equally determined Soviet shock troops fought floor to floor. By the end of the day, the Soviets had reached the top floor, where the infamous photograph of the flag raising was taken. By the end of May 1, the rest of the defenders had either surrendered or been killed. However, the battle for the Reichstag was not the most important thing to happen on April 30. It was on that same afternoon that Adolf Hitler killed himself. Hitler had been suffering from mental and physical disabilities since at least 1943, and he had spent the past few months cowering in his bunker ordering non-existent armies around to do his bidding. Following his death, Joseph Goebbels took control of the Reich, and when he too committed suicide it was left to Admiral Dönitz to sign the surrender. By May 2, most of the German resistance inside Berlin had been crushed. The remnants of the Wehrmacht fled west to surrender to the American and British armies, as they knew falling into Soviet hands would certainly see them sent to a gulag in Siberia. The German surrender was finally signed on May 7, and it came into effect on May 8. The final military actions of the war in Europe would happen around Prague, where the Czech resistance seized the last-minute opportunity to liberate their capital. The German units in Czechoslovakia fought on until May 11, when the Soviets overran them and occupied all of the country. For the USSR, the war was over. They would later join the war against Japan, but their Far East campaign would last just three weeks and saw few casualties for the Soviets. In the four years of war on the Eastern Front, the Soviets lost well over 30 million people, both soldiers and civilians, in the fight against fascism. The Germans, on the other hand, lost around 4 million soldiers fighting the Soviets. Due to the bombing campaign of the Allies, the number of German civilian casualties directly caused by the Soviets remains unknown, but some estimates put it at around 3 million. However, many more German and Soviet soldiers died after 1945 through deportation to the gulags. Stalin's paranoia flared up again after the Second World War, causing him to order the mass deportations of any suspected traitors. This included many Soviet war heroes, as well as members of the average soldiery, who returned home to find themselves sent to Siberia by the man they had spent the past four years fighting for. Following the end of the war, the Red Army remained fairly intact and turned to occupation duties. Whilst Stalin had promised the West that he would allow free elections in all of the Eastern European countries, by the end of the 1940s most of them were effectively Soviet puppet states. Many would not get their independence back until the fall of the Soviet Union half a century later. The war had made the Soviet Union a superpower, but it had come at a staggering cost. All of Eastern Europe suffered and starved under Soviet rule. Every single family had been affected by the war, had lost fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters. It would take decades for life to return to normal. There were no winners in this war, 